Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you, Ralph. Thank you. That was, uh, first of all, a very kind introduction. I appreciate that very much. Uh, Ralph, I, I didn't know that your parents went to Florida and you went to Georgia. You know, I always tell people that the, uh, the American dream is that you always, your kids can grow up to have a better life than you did, but it's not a guarantee. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> but you did all right. So, anyway. Thank you guys for having me here today. I'm really grateful. You've had two phenomenal speakers, and I know a great program, and I thank all of you that expressed an interest in the book. I hope you'll enjoy it. It'll be out Tuesday, although we're going to start signing some of the cards that go ahead of it now. Really, just briefly about the book, um, available for $30 here, 29-something on Amazon. I'm, ki I'm kidding. <laughs> the, uh, you know, it was more as anything else. It, well, it was a couple things. Obviously, it was a tribute to my parents and my grandparents and the sacrifices and hard work. But it was also a tribute to our country and to the realization that in America things were possible that they weren't elsewhere. Now why is that? And I think this is a great forum to talk about that for a few minutes. And I, I talk about these things as often as I do, not just to inform, but to remind, to remind myself of why it is I ran for office when I was 30 points down in the polls. As the book talks about, if you buy it and read it, that there were days where I had significant doubt. In fact, there were days where I didn't want to lose. I was so worried about losing that I I actually pondered getting out of the race or figuring out an excuse to get out of the race. And obviously I was blessed that I didn't do that. And if you read the book, you'll see all the things that happened that made that impossible. I would have gotten out because, but I would have done so for the wrong reasons. I would have done it because I didn't want to meet with failure and I didn't want to be embarrassed. But I'm glad that I wrote that and I'm glad that I went through that because it reminded me that our public service isn't about us or our personal ambitions or what we want people to say about us or wanting to be famous or even about selling books. For those of us who choose to enter public service in this country, we do so because we believe, that what we, we believe that what we have here is special and it's different and it's worth preserving. And each of us is called to contribute, that in different way, to contribute to that in different ways. We're all called to contribute to that as parents and, and as uh, neighbors, as friends, as members of a family, as members of a church, and as members of a community. In fact, it is there where you will make your greatest difference. It is in your everyday life and the people who touch, and more importantly, and the people who, who you inspire through your example, that we make the biggest difference for our country. Uh, those of us look to our faith, and particularly look to early Christian history to remind ourselves that Christianity spread not so much only because of the preaching, but because of the way these people lived. Early Christians were subjected to extraordinary torture, extraordinary oppression. To be a Christian was a capital offense in the Roman Empire in certain stages. We know of instances where Roman emperors literally used Christians as torches. They lined them up along the roadway to make examples of them. And yet, early Christians endured all of this with a sense of peace and of happiness that inspired those around them to inquire, well, what is it about them that's so different? What's the source of this peace and the tranquility that they have in their lives? And obviously that led to the growth in Christianity as much as many other factors. And of course, we're called to be ambassadors of our faith. I say that only because it also reminds us that it's the American example that has inspired the world as much as anything else. It's not just our laws or our speeches or our military power. It's the fact that in this country, real people who found things to be impossible in other places, including the nation of their birth, have through themselves, and as I document in my book, through their children, accomplished things here that would not be possible anywhere else. So it's always worth examining, well, why? Does God happen to love North America more than he does other places? Does God happen to love us, Americans, more than he loves other people? The answer, of course, is no. God loves all of his children. But it's because there's a set of decisions that were made here. And when any, whenever you are asked or told that in politics you must make a choice between your faith or your freedom, between social conservatism and fiscal conservatism, I would make the argument to you that in so many ways they are literally indistinguishable. Because... As Americans, our freedoms are deeply ingrained in our faith. The Declaration of Independence, the principles contained therein, are not really political ones. They don't talk about our rights as given to us by government or leaders. It talks about our rights as given to us by our Creator. And it's in our Judeo-Christian heritage as a nation that those principles took root. That's where that comes from. They didn't just make that up one day. They believed in their hearts because of their faith. 
And because of these faith-based principles, that it is God, our creator, who endows every human being on the planet, not people in North America, not people born here, but people everywhere, no matter who your parents were, no matter how your last name is pronounced, no matter how poor you were the day you were born, every single human being, born and unborn, endowed with certain rights that no government and no leader has the right to deny you. The document, but it doesn't, but it doesn't stop there. One thing is to put that in writing. Then it goes on to say, and by the way, any government that denies you these rights is an illegitimate government. It's the basis of their objection. It goes on to finish by saying, because of this, because your rights finds its source in your creator, in God, because no government has the right to deny you these things, because any government that does deny you these things is an illegitimate government, the only power that government should have is the power that you agree to give it. Now, powerful principles. Other people have constitutions and similar writings, but then you have to live it. Then you have to put those principles into practice in every aspect of your life. And so if you live in a society that has no faith, if you live in a society that teaches or encourages the belief that there is no God, well then what's the source of your rights? If there is no creator, well then what's the source of your liberty? A piece of paper? The eloquent writings of people 230 some odd years ago? It reminds us you cannot have your freedom without your faith because the source of your freedom is your faith. Now what is it? What have those principles led to? They've led to a system of government, not a perfect one. On most days, not ideal at all. If you come to Capitol Hill and watch the debate in Washington, it will frustrate you. It frustrates me. The lack of urgency about these major issues that we face, the petty political games that people play. And yet I realize that in so many other nations in the world right now, we, we solve issues here in America that other people fight wars over. We do here through press releases and floor debate what other people do through the exchange of gunfire. And we're blessed by that. As frustrated as we may get with our republic and the fact that it's not always the most efficient form of government, I hope every single day in your prayers you give thanks to God that you live in one because the alternative is not very good. Amen. By the way, those faith principles also led to a system of, of economics. An economic system that says that what we should have is a system of economics where anyone from anywhere can accomplish anything. Where you are judged not by who your parents were, not by whether you're connected, not by whether you went to the right schools, not by how your last name is pronounced or whether it ends in a vowel, not by whether your parents came on the Mayflower or on a flight from Havana. What matters is not that. What matters is do you have a good idea? Because if you have a good idea and you're willing to work hard, you have a God-given right to pursue that idea and have a God-given right to try to make it work. And you know what that system of economics has produced? Not perfection, but prosperity. It's created prosperity, increasing prosperity. It's not perfect. We do have pockets of despair. We do have people in this country that have been left behind. We do have people in this country that find themselves in very un unfortunate circumstances. And as a society, particularly in your role as members of faith communities, as fathers, as husbands, as mothers, as neighbors, as members of the community at large, we always will have an obligation rooted deeply in not just our faith but in our patriotism to do everything we can for those less fortunate than us. But the best thing we can do is to continue to provide a system of economics where upward mobility is possible and where you are judged by the merits of your idea and, and how hard you work, not by where you came from or who your parents were. Now, I'm literally preaching literally to the choir, right? You may say, well, thank you for telling what we already know. Here's why I tell you this, because it's in dispute. What I just said to you is end debate. Now, it's not that clear. 
when you hear candidates and politicians go back and forth, they don't necessarily admit it, but that's what's at debate. That's at the heart and soul of what we're arguing about in modern American politics. We are arguing about what the source of our freedom is. Is the source of our freedom enlightened leaders that went to Harvard, Yale, or really good schools, and because of that, or the University of Florida, for example, and because of that, <laughs> they tell the people of the University of Georgia what to do? Is that the source of our greatness? Yeah. That's what's in dispute, is the source of our greatness that we've had these really good presidents and these really good senators who are so smart that they know what's the best for the rest of us. We should listen to them. Is the source of our freedom that we have this government that spends its money so wisely and so strategically that that's what's created jobs and created opportunity? Well, that's what one side of the political equation in America literally believes. Read between the lines of their message, and that's what they're saying. You want more prosperity? Give us more power to pass laws. You want more prosperity? Give us the power to take money away from our fellow Americans. They say something more. They say things that are deeply divisive by design. They tell our fellow Americans that the reasons why they're worse off is because other people are doing too well. That the way to protect your job is to raise your boss's taxes. That the only way you could climb up the economic ladder is for us, for you to give us the power to pull some people down. They literally pit Americans against each other by design for purposes of winning an election. And that's never who we've been. That is never who is who we have aspired to be and that is not who we should become. And yet that's what's at issue in these elections. And that's why your activism is important. Now of course it matters because of what our country's gonna look like. We all want our children to be better off than ourselves. And it's important that in this debate we do not allow misinformation to become fact in the minds of some. Oftentimes people who hold their faith dearly and use that as the impetus for their activism and politics feel guilty about it. Because people tell you, don't impose, do not impose your values on others. It's never been about our imposing our values on others. It's never been about that. On the contrary, it's been about the fact that we want to live in a country with a freedom so we can live our values in our lives. And in so doing, aspire hopefully others to do the same. Nor has the movement of what we would describe as constitutional conservative, is, it's not about leaving people behind. On the contrary, we believe, many of us believe we are mandated by our faith to care for those less fortunate than ourselves. And it's not one of anarchy either. We are not anti-government. On the contrary, one of the great blessings, I outlined it at the beginning, is that God has given this nation this opportunity, this blessing, and the prosperity that it needs to maintain this extraordinary republic. And we do, there are things we want our government and needs to do. We want our water to be clean. We want our air to be breathable. We believe government is an important institution in society. It's just not the most important institution in society. <laughs> And it's a reminder of those of us who serve here in Washington that while our job is very important and what I do in the U.S. Senate matters, matters a lot, what I do at home matters more. My job as a father, as a husband, as a member of my church, as a member of my community, as a neighbor, matters more than virtually anything I could ever hope to do in the United States Senate. And that's not just true for me, it's true for you. Because if you want to see the true face of American greatness, you won't find it in her politics. You'll always find it in her people. And the everyday stories of everyday people, who even as I speak to you, are literally changing the lives of others, one person at a time. They give an, they give an elderly neighbor a ride to the doctor. They volunteer countless hours at a homeless shelter. They give well beyond their 10% a month for charity. They dedicate themselves to these things. They're a big brother and a big sister helping inner city disadvantaged youth to learn how to read and prosper. It is, they're starting a business that will employ real families so they can truly leave their, leave their children better off than themselves. No one will ever write magazine articles about them. Cameras will never cover their speeches. They'll never give one. Their face will never be on the cover of a newspaper. And yet it is there where life has changed. One person, one family, one day at a time. 
And this all matters for Americans more than anywhere else because we're not just another country. The American example is the single greatest contribution we've ever made to the world. And in order to fully appreciate it, we need to understand that at its core, the source of our greatness is not our intelligence or even our hard work, although those things matter a lot. It's our blessings. America is not just a great nation. At its core, it's a blessed one. <laughs> blessed with peace. Blessed with peace. With the fact that since the Civil War, we've had to have fight no conflicts on our own soil. Blessed with energy resources, which recent American technological advances has made us perhaps the most energy-rich country on the planet. Blessed with an extraordinary collection of people, a literal collection of go-getters from all over the world, of people that refused to accept the limitations of other societies, so came here or were brought here by their parents, whether it was two, three, four, or five generations ago, in search of a better life. Blessed with another group of Americans who are the descendants of men and women who overcame the most vicious institution one could imagine, slavery, and thereafter the discrimination that followed overcame those things to stake their claim in the American dream. This is literally who we are. This is literally our DNA. We are a collection of the world's go-getters, of people from all over the world that refused to accept that our destiny was in the hands of leaders we never chose, that our circumstances were limited by who we were born to and where we were born. And when you put that collection of people in a place blessed by God with freedom, and an economic system that judges you on your merits, not on your identity, you have America. And the existence of America inspires the world. Because no matter whether they agree with us or not, nations and people all over this planet look to us and find inspiration. And they find... <laughs> and they find the reality that if it's possible here, it can be possible there. That if someone just like them, who came from where they came from, was able to do that here, why can't they try to do that there? And it's so that, and that is where the American light and the American example can make the biggest difference in the world. And so the question for us 21st century Americans is, do we want to continue to be that? Or are we prepared to become just like everybody else? Well, that's not a product of just our choice. It's also a product of our actions. That requires us to do what those who came before us did, confront the issues of our time and solve them. And solve them with a very special obligation over our heads. Because our faith teaches us that to those that much is given, much is expected. You see, at the end of our lives, we'll all be held to account. Whether we had one talent, two talent, or three, we will be asked what we did with these talents. For those of us who share the Christian faith, we know the parable of the talents. I talk about it in my book, and in the book, I talk about how it applies to me. But today, I want to talk about how it applies to us. Because just like people are held accountable individually, we'll also be held accountable in our role as Americans. All of us, at the end of our lives, our faith teachers will be held accountable for what we did. And one of the blessings we've all had is that of Americans, with the opportunity to live in a free and prosperous society. What did you do with it? Did you just take it for yourself? Did you just use it to live 80 fun years of life? Or was it about more? What is it, was it about serving your fellow man? Was it about leaving your children with the opportunities you didn't have? Was it about being example to the world? Was it about raising your voices to confront injustice? Whether it's no matter where in the world it's occurring, including here at home or halfway around the world. Was it for standing for the cause of liberty and freedom because we know that liberty and freedom is not just an American principle. It's a faith-based principle that applies to all mankind. What did you do? What did you do, America? Did you think this was just about enjoying your time and having the most fun that you could? Or did you realize that with your blessings came a special obligation to continue through your example to inspire the world and in so doing to give hope to the hopeless that there was a way to live a better life We'll be asked about that too. And now we're asked to do what every generation before us has had to do. Decide whether we will use these blessings or take them for ourselves. 
Because we're not just blessed so we can have. We're blessed so we can give. And the greatest thing that we can give the world is the American example. The greatest gift that we can give the world is an America that's as great as she has ever been and even greater. And there's no reason why that can't happen. The promise of this new century is real. All over the world, because they have followed our example, millions of people who just a decade ago lived in poverty are now part of the middle class. And by the way, for America, that's great news because they want to buy the stuff we invent and build because they want to visit here and leave their hard-earned dollars in our tourist destinations and because they want to follow our exam example of freedom and democracy. The world is coming in our direction. Why would we ever head the other way? And so, let me close by just saying that what you do matters a lot on a daily basis in the lives of the people that you touch and through your political activism, it will matter more. Because what's truly at stake in 2012 and in the years to come is not just which party controls Washington or which leader lives in the White House. What's at stake is our very identity. There is no reason why the 21st century can't be an American century as well for more people in more places than ever before. The only thing standing between a new American century and today is our willingness to do what it takes to get there. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you.